Hello everyone, I'm Dan Liu. I work on Trello Android, and I'm here to talk about crazy fancy Android techs and the, my sneaky crazy fancy Android. So, uh, I work on Trello. As you may or may not know, in Trello, you can actually use Markdown to make cool little fancy texts in the app. And we've had Markdown in the app for quite a while, uh, but there was a lot of trouble with our old Markdown parser. So this is sort of the story behind why this talk exists in the first place. And I wanted to go over a list, cause, mostly because this is funny, uh, about how bad our Markdown parser was. Uh, it was functional, but there were things like uh, the basic nesting of elements would fail. So if you had like italics text and then bold text inside of it, like that may or may not work. Uh, image loading was iffy at best. If you tried to load one or more images, they may or may not load. Uh, there is endless URL parsing is issues that we had to deal with. Uh, we had uh, normal markdown is fairly easy to do parsing on, but like with we actually handled naked URLs, which means like, like if you just type in HTTP Trello.com, like we should be able to detect that as well. Turns out that's really hard to do with the, the parse that we had. Um, code blocks, which is a big thing that people use in Trello, would fall over due to cool breezes. Like it's amazing the number of things that like you could ent enter into a code block. I believe like if you entered a new line, sometimes it would fail to render. Uh, if you had, if you started with a uh, hash mark, it would fail to render a code block, which is great because it's like, it's not like there's a whole bunch of scripting languages that start with a hash mark as like the very first thing in their file. Um, this is a fun one. If you had HTML escaped entities, it would scramble the text. So like, if you had uh, ampersand, AMP, semicolon, like just all of the text in the paragraph would go to different places randomly. I have no idea why. Uh, and then one of the best ones, there's some random r piece of Russian text that would crash the app. <laughs> this is not Russian text in general that crashed the app. It was just like one particular string. But it was like, there was this card that was like, this is a bug. And if you try to open it in the Android app, it'll just crash your app. So be warned. Uh, so last year, we endeavored to replace all of these issues. And uh, so what we did, <clears throat> the basic process for writing a markdown render is that you have to take the text, you have to convert that into some sort of abstract syntax tree, and then that abstract syntax tree is then compiled into some sort of fancy text view. So for that first part, the text to abstract syntax tree, we use this uh, library that Last has put out called Common Mark Java. <clears throat> it works a million times better than our old uh, markdown parser. And the old markdown parser was called lib sold out, which I never was a fan of anyways, so Forget that old noise. Uh, but then on top of that, I had to write the, I myself had to write the abstract syntax tree to fancy text view part. So that's where I learned basically everything that I'm about to talk about now. Uh, so how do you make fancy text? Well, the simple styling that probably everyone's familiar with is just styling an entire text view. So you get something like this. You have a normal sentence. You have a bold sentence. You have an italic sentence. And you just do that by adding XML attributes very simple. There's a whole bunch of XML attributes you can change with like, you know, the typeface nowadays. You can do different sizes, different colors, different background colors. Uh, but that is not fancy. I promised fancy. And it's really boring if the entire text view looks exactly the same. So here's fancy. Or at least it's something. Uh, and believe it or not, this whole thing is one text view. One text view and one string. Uh, so how does this work? Uh, this whole thing is what's known as a spanable. The spanable, uh... by the way, just a show of hands, how many people have worked with spanables before? All right, cool. So the spanable is a special type of char sequence. So it's, it's sort of like a string, but it allows you to attach these things called spans to it. Um, and spans are this special Android way of marking up language, marking up text. So here we have the word woe has like a superscript span attached to it, so it's raised up above what it normally is. This has an, is italicized, is is lowercase, or is subscripted, wild is bolded. That middle sentence is just has like a different text color, and then there's like a strike through span on that I cheated part. Um, so to make it crystal clear, the definitions are a span is a markup object that can style text. Uh, a span is 
a text that has spans. And then a spanable is a text that has spans and also you can happen to be able to change it. The only reason I bring up the word spanned at all, it's not very useful. Like the concept of spanned is not very useful to you as an Android developer because it's not very useful to have something you can't change. Uh, typically when you're making fancy text, you are mutating it. That is the whole purpose of it. However, the API definitely cares about span because the framework deals with immutable, uh, spanable text all the time. So sometimes like some of the flags and whatnot come from the spanned object. Uh, but it's worth noting that spanable is probably what you'll be using most of the time. So how do you construct these spanables with all these spans inside of them? The really easy way to do this is with HTML. And in, actually, this example here is just using HTML. And so you can actually have HTML inside of a string. So in your string resource, this is, the, this is what produced this text out here. It's got that superscript, that italicized subscript, bold, font color, and strike tags that create that look. Um, and amazingly enough, like this Android system takes that and renders that, in, renders that HTML, which is sort of like madness, because normally I associate resources with like, there's nothing inside of them, it's just text. No, it can actually have HTML inside of it. Uh, <coughs> Alternatively, you can do this in code. So there is an HTML class uh, because this is modern Android development. You're going to want to use HTML compat uh, uh, so that it's backwards compatible. But use HTML compat from HTML. It'll take that same text and it'll render it. In uh, it'll take all those. It'll parse all those HTML tags and turn them into spans. Now, if you take this is the exact same text as in the string. If you take that and you uh, apply it to a text view, you get that. Now, if you remember, that is not what I originally showed, which means that even though it's the exact same text, HTML from, like the from HTML code and the XML string are not the same. So there's, so there's some serious limitations with using HTML. Uh, and limitation number one is that it has very limited tag support. Like it's not, you can't just write whatever the hell HTML you're used to in web dev and, ha and get away with it. It's actually very, it's a, it's a limited subset of tags that it supports. But more importantly, which tags are supported varies between the code version of it and the string resource version of it, which is very confusing. And I actually wrote a blog post way back in 2011 uh, about this. And I go into more detail about how to use HTML and text views. Like you can set up your own tag parsers and whatnot, but that's really like not what I'd recommend now. Like I think HTML and text views is useful for basic internationalization. Like if you want to bold one word in a sentence, that's nice. Uh, but in general, if you want to do something complicated, you should really build your own. And uh, the hard mode is building your own. It is you can only do it in code. You can't do it in XML for the mo like. There's technically one span that you can do in XML, but let's ignore that. Uh, it's much more verbose, but it's super flexible and pow powerful. And that's all of what I'm going to be talking about the rest of this talk. So again, I can recreate that original view. This is the equivalent code in uh, the hard mode, where you're actually constructing it yourself. That's a lot more text. I'll give you all one, one more drink of water so you can all absorb that and fully understand what that all means. No, I'm going to go over what, uh, what's actually going on in there. <clears throat> the first part is we need a spanable of some sort to actually insert our spans into. And there's a few different options you have here. Three, three basic classes that allow you to have spans in them. There's span string, spanable string, and spanable string builder. And the main difference between them is basically whether or not you can mutate the text or the span markup. Uh, <clears throat> so back in the example, I'm using a spanable string because I'm not actually changing the text. I know all the text ahead of time. I just want to apply some spans to it. Uh, but if you're dynamically building up things, a spanable string builder can be useful because then you can like, add text and uh, spans at the same time. And in fact, the spanable string builder is generally what is behind edit texts. That's like what's, what's being used behind the scene. Now, I've seen this chart before online, and they put span string in there, but it is like completely useless. <laughs> I just want to point this out, because you can't mutate any of it, which is like, wait, how do I add spans to it? You don't. 
The only way to create a span string with spans is to first use one of the two lower classes and then turn it into a span string. So that's useless point number one. Useless point number two, to just like rub salt in the wound, is that span string is a spanable string. They use the same implementation. Like literally, they're just extending the same base class where all of the logic is. It's just that span string doesn't give you a set span API call. So don't, don't even worry about that. Uh, so like I said, using a spanable string, I know all the text ahead of time. Then there's all of these set span calls, which I'm going to like make one of these really big and large so I can run through, because uh, this is the bread and butter of, span, of, of spanables, is setting these spans. The first parameter is the span itself. And this is just a markup object. I'll go over how these work later. But they don't actually like, implement some common span interface. It's just some random set of objects that Android knows how to interpret. <clears throat> That'll become a problem later. The next two are just the range at which you're applying that span to. So I want to apply a superscript to the characters at index 0 to index 4. Uh, and then this last thing is the flags. Uh, and if you ever look at this, you're like, what the hell does span exclusive exclusive mean? I see it in all the samples. I don't know what this means at all. And that's totally fair, because it's like totally inscrutable what, what any of that is. Uh, the span flags, in general, define behavior of how your spanable will work when you're editing it, for the most part. This is not a problem that you have as like an Android developer. <laughs> this is a problem that the Android framework has. When, when you like add spans to markup language, you put it in an edit text, and then some user, wily user, goes in and starts editing it. Like it needs to know what happens when like you insert text into a span. Like does it, it does it expand the size of that span or not? Um, but you as a developer, it doesn't really matter. So you can use these flags to, to control precise behavior of stuff. But really, like seriously, either just use the number zero or span, span exclusive exclusive all the time, and it doesn't really make any difference. Um, the only reason I don't like I use span exclusive exclusive because. I worry that like, if, if this text ever becomes editable, that this, that this flag sort of makes the most sense. It basically says, like, if something inserted inside of the, where the span is, then like, expand that span. But otherwise, if things are added at the edge, then don't expand to add that content. Um, but some people just use zero all the time, and it works just as well. So don't worry about those flags. They're complicated, and they don't matter. Uh, I got. <clears throat> this slide exists because I did a practice run of this talk and realized I never once mentioned the fact that you could apply multiple spans to the same piece of text. So just FYI, you can do that. They can overlap. Uh, this has a background span. It's italicized. Uh, it, or, or I guess the front, like the, the text is white instead of black, and the background is black instead of white. So you can apply multiple spans to things. All right. Built-in spans. What spans actually exist within the operating system that you can use? They're kind of like, do I, by the way, do you like this like very? Yeah. This is like <laughs> keynote, keynote Photoshop right here. <laughs> if this is done by taking a blue rectangle and putting it over the letter M, and then putting the letter N up there. <laughs> you too can, you don't have to pay like $99 a month for Photoshop. You can just use Keynote. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that joke was so funny. <laughs> <coughs> no, water went down the wrong pipe. <coughs> hmm. Sorry about that. So there are, there are three kind of basic span types within Android. And the first is spans that just affect the appearance of how the text looks. And then there's sort of metric affecting spans, and it can affect like the size of the text in some subtle way. And then there are spans that affect an entire paragraph of text. Because it turns out that like in language, paragraphs mean something. So most of the spans are appearance only, though. Uh, so for example, you've got the style span, where you can apply things like bold and italics. I'm not going to go through every single span, by the way. Don't worry. Uh, I just want to give a kind of overview of like what is out there. You've got a style span. You can make things italics. There's like an underline span. You can uh, <clears throat> change the foreground color. That just means the text itself. You can change the background color. Uh, and then you can also do some kind of crazy things like URL span. This act, I mean, it changes the appearance, but it also changes the behavior. Because why not? 
Uh, you want to be able to have URLs that you can click and open and stuff, and so that's what URL span does. Then we have metric affecting spans. So this actually changes the size of the text. And so the superscript and subscript that I was showing you earlier, the text actually needs to make space for those things to exist. The relative size span is really fun, because that like you can say, like, hey, I want the world to be three times bigger than the rest of the sentence. Bam. Well, now, now you're obviously, the rest of the sentence needs to make space for that. <clears throat> And then there's all this, this whole concept of replacement spans, where it replaces a piece of the text with something completely different. And this is pretty much just exists for image span to, to be a thing. So I can insert an image inside of text that way. And it's actually completely replacing the word world with an image. So therefore, obviously, it's going to change how everything's laid out. And then finally, there's like paragraph affecting spans. So the simplest example of this is having a leading margin span. So if I want to have a leading margin on an entire paragraph, well, look, so the first, the first sentence, or the first paragraph doesn't have it. It's just rammed up against the side of the emulator. Second paragraph does have it, so the whole thing's indented. You can have a drawable margin span. So if you want some crazy image at the front, ta-da. Uh, uh, bullet points, that's a common thing with uh, spans. That is a bullet span. If you squint, you can see it just barely next to the letter P. <clears throat> And then there's the quote span, which adds a nice little blue line right next to the paragraph. So if you, if you just like, if you all want to come up here, <laughs> it's right here. I can't actually see that pixel. Maybe you can't see it like from five feet away. OK, so there are some bad built-in spans. <clears throat> like the span API is sort of a mess. <laughs> so these are just the ones that I run into personally. Like I've only dealt with maybe like, half of the spans out there, because that's all I really needed to use for the markdown parser. But the bullet span sucks. Like, here's why you could barely see it. It's defined as being a two pixel circle. Not a two density independent pixel circle, a two pixel circle. This made a lot of sense on your T-Mobile G1, uh, which, with its low resolution, with, its, with the high high resolution density screens now, like makes no sense whatsoever. Someone finally noticed this and changed bullet spans so that you can define its, the, the size of the bullet. You actually could not do this until API 28, though. So the bullet span up until API 28 was basically invisible. The quote span has the exact same problem. You basically can't customize anything. It's a one pixel line. Uh, and again, it sucks until API 28 when someone actually looked at it and was like, hey, maybe we should make this not suck as much. Um, the URL span has an issue, which is that <clears throat> when you click it, it just launches an intent. It just calls start activity whatever intent data you just passed it. <clears throat> the problem is, if there's no app to handle it, the Android OS is like, you tried to start an activity that doesn't exist, we're just gonna crash. <laughs> so when you're working in an app like Trello, which lets people write whatever the hell URL they want and absorb it, <clears throat> and then people would click on those URLs, it would crash the Trello app, which is great. <laughs> so how do you fix this problem? Well, you want to write some custom spans. Now you may be like, what, what the hell is this picture? Spam it's spam sushi, yeah. <laughs> Hawaiians are crazy about spam, if you didn't know. And this is like a thing that you can just buy in like convenience stores in, in Hawaii. <clears throat> so the, the basic process for writing your own custom span is first you want to pick the correct span to extend. Then you need to go uh, try to decipher how it works either by looking at the API documentation, which is usually non-existent, or going and looking at the actual source code. And then the last step is to get very frustrated by how limited the span API is. Um, so to do Give you an example of this. I'm going to run you through the, idea, the thematic break span that I added. So a thematic break is like a horizontal rule. That's one of the things in Markdown. So there's a bunch of paragraphs, standard lorem ipsum, and then there's, there's thematic breaks between them. So the first question is, what do I extend? What makes sense to extend? Because there's a bunch of different classes you can extend within spans that give you different uh, abilities to do things. The span API is super weird. Like I said before, there's no single like span interface that everything extends from. There's just a bunch of random interfaces that exist with random functions that text views will listen to and render differently as a result of. 
And so you're limited to just whatever those functions that exist are. <clears throat> so the easiest thing is to pick something to ex some span that exists already that is close to what you want to do. <clears throat> so in this case, what seemed closest, if you squint your eyes really tight, is a replacement span. Because <clears throat> essentially, I want there to be no text there. I want to replace whatever text would exist with just a line. So that's what I chose. I wanted to chose, choose a replacement span as the uh, basis for this. So then I go to the API. And the first method looks so far so good. It's a draw function, draws the span of the canvas. Great, I'll just draw a rectangle. That'll be easy. Next one, get size. That returns the width of the span. Great, but I want to define the height of the span. How do you do that? Well, it turns out if you go into the API documentation, it says you, you take the font metrics int that you get, and you define the height of that, and that defines the height of the replacement span, which is bonkers. Like, I'm messing with this font metrics thing to define the height of something which is replacing font. Um, and then, again, because this is all just like extending classes that do random functions, there are also these two functions that come along with it where the API itself says, these do nothing. Because what text views do is they see a replacement span and they say, oh, I only care about the top two functions. I'm just going to actively ignore these bottom ones. So yeah, the span API is really weird. Uh, so here's like an abbreviated version of how the thematic break span works, just breaking it down like one function at a time. So of the two functions you have to write, get size is the interesting one because you want to define like how tall this is going to be. Uh, I actually return the number one for the width, even though I want to take up the entire width. And there's two reasons for that. The first is that I know as a developer that I'm putting, I'm basically just having a new lines around it, so there's nothing like, I don't have to worry about some other text getting in the way. The second is because there's some bug in API 28 where if you uh, set the size incorrectly, it'll actually render twice. Again, you have to get frustrated by the API at some point. And then again, I need to use this font, this font metrics int, which they define as maybe being null at some point. So you do have to check that. And uh, uh, the way that fonts work is that you have to define the ascent and descent. So there's this baseline that text is. So if you imagine like the letter J, like the letter J goes below the, di the that point. So that's where the descent is. Some letters go above, like how far above that baseline it goes is the ascent. Um, but I don't worry about that too deeply because I'm just like trying to define a certain height. So I just say the ascent is, is the whole of the height that I want and the descent zero. Uh, but then also the docs don't specify whether it cares about ascent and descent or if it cares about top and bottom because those both essentially mean the same thing. So I just do both, hoping that uh, I don't end up on some random Samsung device where everything works slightly differently because why not? Uh, and then in the actual draw function itself, it's pretty standard. This is, it's just a call to draw rect. What is interesting though is that, uh, and this is pretty standard practice in spans, is that you reuse the paint that's passed to you instead of creating your own paint object. And so you kind of take whatever you're going to set up on your paint, you take stock of what it existed at before. So the first step is like, I'm going to get the current color and style that it's using. Second step is I set the color and style that I want when I draw. Then I draw it. And then the last step is I set it back to the way it was before. And this is nice and efficient because if someone has like 50 thematic break spans in their text, if I didn't do this, I'd be creating 50 different text paints. I don't want to have to do that. So this is, an, this is a nice trick here. So there's a couple very serious span limitations in general. Uh, serious limitation one, which I've been harping on this whole time, is that it's, you're very bound by what the API provides. You don't get to like draw whatever the hell you want with spans. You have to take what it gives you. And it's, it can be very frustrating. And there's definitely things that we wanted to do that we couldn't do because of just how it works. For example, um, when you have like inline code blocks, we wanted to, to change the background of the color slightly. That's easy. There's a background color span. We just change the color of the background. It turns out that that background color draws right up to the edge of the beginning and end of the text. Imagine just so it looks pretty. Maybe you want it to like go one pixel past like the letter A and the letter P. Like you just don't want it, you don't want it rammed up right on it. Nope, can't do that. That's just not the way the API works. 
Um, the way that the background color text works is that you get to modify the text paint, and that's it. You don't get to modify the metrics at all. If you want to modify the metrics, you have to completely replace the text. And I want to completely replace the text. I just want the text to be a slightly different color. So the, the, you can be very frustrating uh, creating custom spans. The other big limitation is you can't parcelable custom spans. So why does that matter? Why can't you create a custom span that's parcelable? Well, parcelable, which is also the most awful word in the Android language, <laughs> uh, that's how you copy and paste text around. So if you, if you select text and you copy it and paste it to another app, all of that has to be parceled before it can be absorbed by the other app. Your custom spans will not be absorbed by the other app. So in other words, your custom spans cannot be uh, exported. So what does that mean? It means that if you go super crazy on custom spans, but you allow people to copy and paste it, like it's going to look really weird elsewhere. And it can crop up in interesting places too. So for example, like notifications. Notifications are not your app. Those are being displayed by the system, op like by the operating system. So any of your custom spans don't show up in notifications either. So what this means, you have to choose really wisely what you extend. Again, because if someone copies and pastes that text, whatever you extend, that's what it's going to fall back on when, you actually, when it actually copies out. So for example, when we are creating all of my, cust all of my custom spans that I created, um, I created a better URL span that doesn't crash the moment you click a link that the Android operating system doesn't understand. But there I'm ex extending the URL span. Because if someone copies and pastes it, then at least they will still have that URL that they can click on. Uh, so both for the bullet span and the quote span that I created, those, those just expend the normal bullet span and quote span. It may look ugly as sin, but at least it's close to what it's supposed to look like originally if someone copies and pastes it out. Um, we wanted to create a, a code background span. So like if you want to have a background beyond a, the code block of text, we expanded the line background span. Now the line background span is an interface. It has no behavior by default. So whatever, you copy and paste, nothing happens essentially. We created a list item span because we wanted to be able to have like not just unordered lists, like different bullet points, but also like number one, two, three, four. And we need all of those to be aligned. Um, this is where I learned it's actually very complicated aligning all those numbers. The web just does it for you magically when you create ordered lists. Uh, it's really hard on Android uh, and not built in. So you have to write this yourself. Um, but that really isn't portable. Like that, the solution I have really is not portable because those numbers are being drawn by me. It's not actually text or present in the original uh, text. So I just have it fall back on bullet span because I was like, it's close enough. It's an unordered list instead of an ordered one. And then again, the, the thematic breaks down I was showing you for the replacement span. All right, some odds and ends, some random little tips I have about span, working with spans. Uh, reusing spans. So this is very important to me because uh, in Markdown, you know, someone can, someone can end up applying hundreds of spans depending if, if they have really complicated Markdown. So what I really wanted to do was to say, OK, I want to just create one bold span, and then I'll apply it over and over and over again. So I don't have to create like 50 different bold span objects. If you use it, this code, it looks something like this. And I applied two bold spans, but only one, one word got bolded. All right, so this does not work, which is unfortunate. Basically, you have to create a new span for every set span call. What are you going to do? The reason it doesn't work is because spans use identity equality. They don't implement equals or anything like that. So when it's looking through for spans, it says, oh, I've got a bold span. Oh, someone's inserting a new bold span. Oh, it's the exact same as my old bold span. I just have to, I just have to reuse it. Um, so I've tried it. It doesn't work. Sorry. Spacing new lines. This is a cool little trick. Uh, so I wanted to have new lines between text. The default paragraph spacing sucks on Android. And it turns out it's really hard to like, if you do new lines between them, you know, like a double new line, it looks way too large, like what you see on the left there. Because uh, it's essentially the entire height of a, of a line of text. There is theoretically some really tricky way to do this with like line height spans. I don't recommend it because it just 
gets into a huge mess because there's bugs in older versions of Android and whatnot. The trick that someone taught me that works really well is to just use new lines, but then use a relative size span to make them smaller. So it's like, oh, hey, it's a new line. It's exact same output as on the left, only those new lines are half the height. And suddenly, your paragraphs look a lot better. Construction optimization. So this is an important thing to me because, like, like I said, you have two basic classes for constructing your, your, uh, your spanable. Uh, with the markdown parser, I get an abstract syntax tree. That abstract syntax tree is then converted into the spanable. So I'm essentially like, the way that it works, I'm just grabbing tons of pieces of text, adding that text, adding spans as I go. So spanable string builder was definitely the answer here. But it turns out spanable string builder was not the answer in terms of construction time. That when I started uh, profiling this, that the spanable string builder alone, just the fact that I was calling append and set span was taking up 98% of the time for constructing this. It turns out it was way faster to instead create like the span info data class and a string builder and uh, construct, this, construct the text and then at the very end create a spanable string and apply all of these span infos to it. Uh, now the reason it's so much faster is because the spanable string builder is designed for editing. Like I said, it, it's like the power engine that is designed for edit text. And so it's really good at inserting text into random places. Uh, it uses this thing called an interval tree internally, which is this very complicated data structure. But if you're doing it for just like appending a whole bunch of appends and a whole bunch of set spans all at once, it's really slow there. So in fact, like the construction speed when using a spanable string builder for like my uh, the corpus that I was using to, to test performance took 51 milliseconds. All right, so that's like multiple missed frames to try to do that. <clears throat> When I use Sprint String Builder, which then gets converted into a spanable string, it took one and a half milliseconds instead. So that's like a huge speed up. Now it's worth noting, that's not the only part of performance. Because there's another part of performance that's actually laying out the text. Turns out Spanable String Builder is really good for layout. Like it's faster than layout than using a spanable string. I did not care because <laughs> um, the construction speed was so much faster. Uh, there's a linked article there. I wrote all this stuff up and then like went into way more detail about it. Uh, but it's, and I don't mean to like demonize Spanable String Builder. Spanable String Builder is fine for most cases. But if you're doing something as complicated as like Markdown, where you're like writing a whole bunch of spans and depending all at once, then it's maybe you should consider something else. Replacement spans. So again, it replaces some text there. What exactly are you replacing? You're not allowed to just set a replacement span on nothing. That doesn't make any sense. We're replacing something. Why would you replace nothing? Says the Android. Uh, API. So what, what do you want to actually have there? I just want to point out basically that the invisible character is a bad choice. The idea might be like, oh, I'll put the invisible character here, and then uh, it's, it's very hard to debug, let's just put it that way. You get into logcat, and you're like, what's going on here? This set string looks exactly the way I want it to look. It's like, no, there's an invisible character in there, but it doesn't print out because it's logcat. Don't use an invisible character. Learn from my mistakes. Uh, I think the best answer is to have some fallback, good fallback text if the replacement span failed for some reason. So for example, if this is like an image uh, from some URL, you could just have like a URL in its place. So if someone actually tries to copy and paste it, it doesn't work in the other app, then the fallback could be uh, just the URL. The other thing that I use often is a space character. Again, because you'll notice it in the logs. Testing spans. So suppose you've constructed some crazy markdown and you want to have some t tests to actually test that the markdown that you created is correct, some automated tests. However, comparing two, comparing two spanables is very difficult. Uh, the span API is very weird uh, because spans don't implement equals. Or, or the span API is weird. Git span is very weird. Like when you re retrieve the spans from a spanable, it's just a bizarre API. But spans also do not implement equals. So you can't just do like this spanable string equals this other spanable string. You actually have to like go in and deconstruct the spans yourself. And then on top of that, even if you deconstruct, deconstruct the spans, not all the span attributes are public. So this is just kind of a lot of work. You have to do this thing where like, okay, I have this spanned object. I get the spans on it. Um, 
the way that this API works to like retrieve the spans is you say between this between these two indexes, give me all spans of a particular type. Here I'm saying give me all spans of any type, but you can have it be like I just wanted to like I don't know replace some spans or something. And then if you want to get the start and end of those actual spans, because it gives you an array of just the span objects, not the start and end or flags, you have to call again like get span start, get span end, get span flags. Now you have all the information you need to actually compare the spans. And then you can call things like assert span equals. Uh, and then hopefully you have something like the relative size span where it actually has attributes you can compare. But then you have things like the leading margin span where you can actually get at the variables you use to construct it. And you just have to call functions within it to verify that they're actually, they come, they come out the same. All right. So like I've been talking about, all this stuff comes out of the time I spent working on Markdown. Um, but there is a lot of other cool stuff you can do with spanables. And I decided, for the sake of time, and also the fact that I was not an expert on it, that I would just defer to the experts for stuff that I was not, had not purposely worked on. So what I really recommend, if you want to get more into this, is Florina's uh, Medium blog posts about uh, spanables and how she works with them. They're fantastic articles. Uh, they go over topics that I didn't go into, like optimizing how you actually use spans. So there's, there's just some crazy things, like if you, if you set um, a spanable on a text view, it actually creates a whole copy of that spanable before it even uses it. So there's ways to like get around that whole issue. I decided I didn't need that optimization, not yet at least, um, but if you need that sort of level of power for your, you know, recycler view or whatever, you can do that. So you go in like styling international text and what have you and more things, like I really recommend that. And then there's a Google I.O. talk about uh, text in general that is fantastic. It go like every minute has mind-blowing information. It goes in a lot in detail about how you actually like lay out text. Uh, it's a great talk. That's pretty much it for me. That's what I got. So anyone have any questions? Question one, when are you going to open source your markdown parser? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the first implementation of it. Um, with Trello very specifically in mind. Like you can save time if you're not trying to open source something because you can write it very specifically to your situation. Uh, that said, I would like to look into open sourcing it. It'll just take some effort because I have to kind of reconfigure things to like take the weird Trello specific code and make it so that that's not something everyone has to have. <laughs> so uh, that's my, yeah. Any other questions? Can you span right to left? Uh, no. Or are you, what do you mean exactly Within by that? Within a string, say you have like Hebrew in the middle of the string, can you write to left or left to right, switch the orientation of that text within the span? I, that, is not a, that is not a domain that spans work with. That, strangely enough, I have some expertise in that from like way long ago. That is the domain of what's known as the, the bi-directional algorithm, which has, there are these invisible characters called the right to left marker and the left to right marker. So the bidirectional algorithm uh, determines how the hell to work with text that's left to right and right to left within the same string and not have everyone go crazy. And so every character essentially has an orientation. And so like the English language, A through Z, that's all left to right. Hebrew, all of that stuff is right to left. And then you have a bunch of characters in, in the middle that are directionless. And some of them are like hard direction lists, and some of them are soft direction lists. And so like space characters, I think are like, oh, which are they? I don't remember. But essentially, it's like it's like how much so it it attaches to what's next to it. Um, so like if you have a space between two English words, and that space is going to be left to right. If you have a space between two Hebrew words, it'll end up being right to left. What gets really complicated is when you have left to right and right to left language right next to each other. Like what happens with that space character there? And that's where these invisible, they have these invisible right to left and left to right markers that you insert into text that fixes situations that can happen there. And there is a whole separate library. There's someone from Facebook who gave a really great talk about it a few years at DroidCon, um, Ahmed. Uh, and he, he was talking, there's, there's APIs for getting around this, but it's not a domain of spans, basically. So you mentioned the code blocks. Was that to, like, you actually have support for color and 
No, we're just, right now we're just um, indenting and, and having a nice background. We certainly, like, we certainly could take all that text and like, because it, because it, essentially it's just colors, right? So we could, like, that's one of the easiest things to do is color the text with spans. So we certainly could do that, but that would require a second parser that like parses the syntax and generates which colors should be there, and we haven't gone to that level yet. Curious how long it took to replace the old clunky open source version and go to this? About a month. It was helped. It was helped immensely by there being something very similar to it beforehand. So there's a library called Markwan that's open source um, that didn't quite do things I wanted it to do. So I was like. I can probably do better than this, um, but it still was helpful to have like some launch pad of ideas for where to start from. Um, you, if, we, if I ever open source this, it is not that I took Mark One and like modified one or two things. It's like dramatically different, but it was very helpful to like have that as a starting point. Um, also, the fact that it was written internally within Atlassian meant I could just go ask the person who wrote it for like help with various things. So that was super helpful. Um, but yeah, it's about a month. Any other questions? Cool, we're good.